Okay, we are live. We're live and we're going to talk about dressing for success. You can see even when I was a little tyke 60 plus years ago, or well, no, 60 years ago, I was dressing for success. What do you guys think? What do you guys think about that? You think it's a good idea to dress for success? There's an official time check. It is 5 p.m. It is 5 p.m. here on the East Coast, USA, USA, East Coast. So we are live with an emergency broadcast, and I hope the notifications went out. We just, I just scheduled this thing. And so we're going to talk about dressing for success, wearing the correct wristwatch, which is a big part of your attire, if you're, uh, especially if you're a man. That's one of the few things you can wear to to really uh, set yourself off. And, of course, you can do the. Uh... Yeah, you can do the faux pay bracelet. Also, if you're a man, you can kind of push the envelope a little bit with a faux pay bracelet. So check out the 002 starting up. OK, I'm going to start up the spring drop. I'm going to wind it and you're going to see there right at the beginning, it goes about double speed for maybe four seconds or so. And then it slows down once the regulator kicks in and then you. How cool is the way the um, the spring drive starts up, whether you give it a wind and then it's it's using the unencumbered power from the spring to run a little bit faster. And then as the tri synchro regulator kicks in. It governs that speed to be right where it needs to be. And it takes a few seconds for all of that goodness to happen. So there you go. I'm here with the lovely lady, Brianna, and we just did a couple of other videos. But we're going to do one quick one talking just about the faux pay bracelet. I posted a... So just search faux pay and you'll find that whole video and talk about dressing for success. Folks, you want to set yourself out from the competition a little bit. You want to get a little bit of a competitive edge, right? And these days with most people dressing as slobs all the time, it doesn't take much to get a little competitive edge, just a decent shirt, maybe with some starch in it like this one. And this, by the way, is an oldie, but a goodie that um, was made in the USA. It's a Ralph Lauren polo made in the USA. Here I have, I have a picture of the label. See that? That's this very shirt. <clears throat> and um, don't make them like this anymore. But this is an old one. It's got a little bit of a stain here on the sleeve. Maybe you guys can see it in the picture. Maybe it's, depending on the angle, you might be able to see it. I don't know if the cleaners did that or, or what they did about a couple of years ago or whenever. So I don't wear this one that often. But... Um, it's an oldie but a goodie. I got a bunch of similar ones like this. <clears throat> so a decent shirt, a decent watch. I, I think that a gold stunner is always appropriate. A gold stunner. Let me know what you guys think about that. Um, obviously, you can wear a steel watch, but you don't want to wear something that is too big for the occasion. It's too big. It's just too big. Yeah. Because, you know, it just doesn't look right to wear something that's too big. You see a lot of people, that's a mistake a lot of people make these days with the big watch craze going on is they have these huge watches that they're wearing. This watch is 38 and a half mils and on my 7.25 inch or so wrist, it gets a little bigger in the summertime. But this is about as big as I would want to wear, <coughs> excuse me, for a dress watch. My sport watch stunner is bigger, but it wears nice. It drapes around the wrist nice because the way the lugs are shaped and the bracelet and everything that I can get away with it. And in a sport situation, and of course, my old eyes appreciate that bigger dial. So, yeah, you want to get something that's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, that's what they said when they saw this watch. That's what they said when they saw this watch. You say, who's they? It's pretty much everybody. Look how this young lady reacted when she saw the 002. What? I mean, this is amazing. Yeah, it's beautiful. Wow, this is really pretty. I, 
can't make this stuff up. That that was her exact reaction when she saw the watch. And you saw Ryan live on this show how he reacted when he saw it. Because the Triforce Rich says, what does Ryan think of the 002? Should he get a close look? He's talking about this watch. This is the SBGY <laughs> 002 Grand Seiko. This is a Grand Seiko is a, a line that competes with Rolex. It's mm-hmm. their high-end line. Steve at Little Treasury Jewelers is where this came from. He's over in Gambrels, Maryland. He's a destination jeweler. Mm. And so they want you to take a look at the at the SBGY002, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. They, they they want your opinion oh, yeah. on it. See, this is a deployment class. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Doesn't it, it and looks so, like it? Uh-huh. So and it fits kind of trim to the wrist. It and then you notice that second hand. See yeah. how it doesn't click? Yeah, it yeah. It just yeah. smooths around. Oh, it's yeah. It's called the nice. spring drive. Uh-huh. There's no battery in there, but there's a spring in there that releases the energy and then drives the 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 second hand like that oh, okay it's beautiful so there you go he said it's beautiful i like it two nicely thum- done two two thumbs up on the question from triforce yeah, that's a beautiful uh, watch. there you go okay <laughs> hey i i'm not making this stuff up folks that's actual footage from the show actual footage from the show so you know you have to choose wisely when you when you get a timepiece that you might live with for a long time you have to choose wisely you must choose Choose wisely. You have chosen wisely. That's what you got to do, because otherwise you're going to have a reaction like this when they see your watch if you didn't choose wisely. It looks like somebody's nightmare. Hear what she said? It looks like somebody's nightmare. Looks like somebody's nightmare. You don't want them to say that. You don't want them to say that. You know, in, the, in the, a lot of the forums, I've been pointing out that some of these watches have issues that people are posting pictures of and that some of them are downright ugly. And there's a problem. They just they can't handle the truth. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. They can't handle it. They can't handle it. And one of the forum, one of the watch groups actually removed me from the group. <laughs> so there you go. Let's get to the comments. Stig says, uh, good evening, Craig and everybody. Our Wags is in the house. And he says, Chip, wasn't there a best-selling book in your youth title, Dress for Success? The problem is nobody is dressing for success anymore. Well, we're going to talk about that book. He did a lot of studies, and it was, it, it was a well-done uh, case study on the subject. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that if we get a chance. And um, our Wags is saying hi to Stig, and Stig's in the house. Cheers, Our Wags, here in Denmark. Casual rules in anger and despair. I just went to Sweden and bought a new um, Stets. You mean Stetson? Stenson. Stenson. I'm not sure. You mean Stetson? Okay. Yeah. Oh, there. You, you recorrected it. Okay. And um, evening all from Tom. <clears throat> and... Uh, Jen says, hey, Craig, greetings from San Diego. That GS002 is gorgeous. Well, thank you. I have to say, I, we talked about it on the channel here for a long time. I debated back and forth whether or not to buy it. I looked at all possibilities. We looked at Vacheron. We looked at Patek Philippe. We looked at all kinds of possible dress watch alternatives, if you will. And none of them could top this 002. And when I finally saw it in person... It was just like, oh, my God, I have to have it. <clears throat> I didn't tell Steve that <clears throat> when I first saw it because I wanted to negotiate. It's not good from a standpoint of negotiations if you immediately tell the seller that you have to have it no matter what. Right. So I didn't do that. I'm like, well, I'm not so sure. I, you know, I hemmed and hawed a little bit <clears throat> and I worked out a great deal, paid him, got all the paperwork signed over, got the watch. And then I said, you know what? I would have paid sticker. So, you know, like the scene in, um, uh, what was that movie? Um, the Thomas Crown Affair, where he tells the people that they paid too much for the building, right? <laughs> he, was, he was a seller. He sold the building. And after it was all done, they're all congratulating themselves and so on. And, you know, he looked at him and he said, you paid too much. Pretty cool. He was a cool character in that movie. The Thomas Crown Affair. Catch it. You got to catch it. Talk about dressing for success. He always dressed nice throughout that entire movie, whether he was dressing casual or or more formal. Would Bree rather have one Bitcoin or one million Doge coins? You'll have to ask her. She's going to do a show, I believe, Sunday night. And I think she's going to have um, Kent, Kent Courtney with her live on the show. 
So tune in for that one. That'll be cool. You guys want a Choo Choo Charlie back. Choo Choo Charlie's coming back. Drive Force Rich in California. If you wear any sort of button shirt that's well fitting, you're pretty much very well dressed. There you go. That's it doesn't take much. The bar has been lowered quite a bit, folks. Just a nice pair of shoes might get you above the matting crowd. It's too hot in California. Business executives wear shorts and made in China shirts. Well, you could wear a nice pair of shorts and you could wear a nice made in USA vintage shirt. All right, there's only a couple of companies still making them in the USA, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Trevor's Rich agreed. Uh, Fitted Henley served me well, never underdressed for the office, a night out, or just lounging at the cafe. Yeah, wear something decent. You will you will stand out from the crowd. It won't take much these days. And it doesn't have to be formal. It can be, you know, a more casual, like a polo shirt, a nice 100% cotton, made in USA, older polo shirt, something like that. Again, they're hard to get uh, these days, made in USA, I think, but something like that would would be a, a nice classic right a nice um lacoste right shirt <clears throat> you also have the hipsters who try to dress well but they usually wear extremely tight fitting dress clothes uh low-waisted leg cuts are way too high to show their obnoxious socks and brown shoes <laughs> and the real short uh suit jackets right that look like they're from the little boys department yeah Um, <clears throat> Trevor's Rich says, uh, brown shoes being an obnoxious brown shade, not a classy one. Yeah, I, I got you. Not like a dark brown, you know, really, really rich looking shade. And of course that silly suit that, uh, in the latest James Bond movies that, that he wore those little, like little boy suits. Um, <clears throat> there's also these idiots wearing tight sport coats and sneakers. <laughs> oh God, God help us. Uh, Henleys are my favorite. I do wear a lot of Athletshire, though. Okay, so that's athletic, leisure stuff, I guess. I'm not hip to all this, this newfangled stuff. But that's because I knock out a task and then get a workout. And there you go. Okay, good. And uh, Trevor Switch, for sure, um, athleisure definitely has its purpose and place. Okay, cool uh carl um i've never wear i never wear sneakers dress shoes and i'll never wear brown sh dress shoes with a blue belt <laughs> with a blue suit okay <laughs> carl i um, loving the show tonight tom in the house well thank you for coming in triforce rich the art of dressing well is the middle ground it's not hard for someone to dress you up in a formal wear or to wear something very casual, being well-dressed in the middle uh, takes time to learn. Hey, a nice pair of khakis, a nice pair of Bill, Bill's khakis and a um, polo shirt or a Lacoste, something like that, or like a, just a button-down Oxford uh, cloth shirt um, and a nice belt and some nice shoes can be uh, very easy to pull off, I think. Very easy and, and works in almost any situation. I, I, I wear that 99% of the time now. I almost never wear a suit. I wear a nice pair of khakis. If it's wintertime, I'm wearing a tie. And I, I won't have the sleeves rolled up. I'll have the sleeves down. And I'll have a nice uh, cashmere sport coat on. And that's it. I mean, you can wear that anywhere. And, and you can skip the tie if you want to be a little more casual. You can just skip the tie and go open collar like this with a cashmere sport coat. Real nice one and uh, some nice shoes, nice alligator belt and call it a day or an evening. Um, Craig, was it easier years ago to set up a Bitcoin wallet anonymously? <clears throat> I think you can still do it. You, you're limited on the things that you can do. The problem where they need to get your identity and all that is when you're connecting to a bank account and moving money from a bank account into the wallet. I think you can set up a lot of wallets relatively anonymously. It's where the problem is if you want to move money into some of these services, that's where you get to where they need to know your customer laws. Um, but uh, 
years ago, I mean, there wasn't any of this know your customer stuff. I mean, people weren't fooling with any of that, but there weren't as many services either. There weren't services like BlockFi where you could deposit your Bitcoin and get interest and all that kind of stuff, right? But when you do all those kinds of things, now you open yourself up to the know your customer laws. Um, <clears throat> yes, it do not take too much. When I wear my Stetson in the grocery store, the ladies call me, sir. <laughs> I guess they do. They treat you with a little bit of respect. That's right. A little bit of respect. I miss the days when you wore a suit and a fedora on the live streams. When the cold weather comes back, I'll do it again. It's just kind of warm in here. <laughs> I'm cheap. I don't run that much air conditioning in the summer. When the cool, when the wintertime comes, I'll be... I'll be wearing like cashmere sport coats, suits, what, and I'll be wearing them to stay warm. <laughs> and because I, that time of the year, I like to wear them. I enjoy it, but not when it's hot. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> so let's see what else. Uh, see, see, and the problem, what we, what we have with a lot of these, um, a lot of these forums is a lot of them, a lot of times we have a failure to communicate. I'll put it that way. They they don't grasp concepts very well. They they don't have a high level of understanding. What we've got here is failure to communicate. See, they they thought that I was belittling them and giving them a hard time and trolling them and all that when in truth I was actually trying to be helpful. I was trying to explain that there's no reason to spend a lot of money on an ugly watch when you can spend a lot of money and get a stunner, right? That's what I, I was trying to help them with that situation. And now instead they barred me from the group and they continue to buy these ugly watches and talk about these ugly watches and push these ugly watches and so on and so forth. So I tried, I tried to help them, but you know, sometimes you just can't help people. Um, Craig, have you ever played at adventure park USA? Well, what do you mean by played? I've gone there a bunch of times. I don't ride the rides and things like that. I've eaten a nice, nice, uh, barbecue dinner there. I have a video on my channel of the barbecue from there. Um, I've covered some events there, but I'm not a big person on the rides and, and those kinds of things. Um, I, I don't do that much, but, uh, yeah, I've been there many times though. <clears throat> uh, I miss the days where I wasn't called, sir. It makes me feel old. Oh, there you go. There you go. I hear you. Well, wait till you get to be my age. Everybody will call you, sir. If they, if they have any sense of decorum, right? Okay, uh, Jens, uh, my go-to summer outfit, cognac brown brogues, tan khakis, cream white polo or Henley with 18 karat Rolex date just, a result compliments and courtesy. Yes, they treat you with respect. They treat you with respect. That's what they do. Uh, and Tom likes that style. Craig, what is the price range for the Signet ring? Oh, good, good question. Um, I talked to Steve. He's done some initial research. And it seems like it's going to be for 18 karat gold ring, man's. It seems like it's going to be in the $1,500 price range. It ain't going to be cheap because he's, he doesn't do junk, right? And these are going to be custom engraved and so on. But I've seen signet rings for much more money than that. So I, I don't think that's outrageous for a high quality piece in 18 karat gold. Um, but that's what he's talking at the retail in the 1500, 1600 range in that range is where we're talking right now. Uh, but he has to do some more checking and he's got to figure out who's going to do the design. I gave him a rough idea of what I wanted on the design on it. And I want them to be numbered so that there'll be limited edition numbered items. Um, and anybody that's a subscriber will be able to get one and they're going to be first come first grab. So I'll have number 001, I'll have number one and whoever buys the second one will have number two. That might be Steve. He might buy one. I don't know, but the numbers are going to go first come first grab. Um, so, um, feel free to also correspond directly with Steve about them, about the rings and he'll keep you in the loop. Just tell him you're a subscriber. 
uh, Steve at LittleTreasury.com, Steve at LittleTreasury.com. And I'm hoping he'll have at least mine, the first one, 001, I'm hoping he'll have it ready at the event. But the way he drags his feet sometimes, <laughs> that might be wishful thinking. Triforce Rich in the house. The only thing I pretty much avoid unless necessary is a tie. Ties can look great, but they're also so impractical if I'm going to formally eat out. It just gets in the way. I hear you, but um, the one thing about a tie is it does help keep you warm when it's a cooler day, you know, with your collar all closed up and the tie and everything. It helps keep you a little warmer. So there's that advantage. But I hear you about the disadvantages. And there's a thank you for Tom. And uh, let's see, very sharp looking shirt. Yeah, this is an oldie but a goodie. It, th this is a Ralph Lauren polo. Oh, by the way, speaking of oldies but goodies, look how you look how I used to dress when I was a little tyke. How you like this? Check this out. That's Craig. Notice the French cuffs and the and the uh, vest and the bow tie. That's how Craig dressed when he was a little tyke. What do you think about that? You can't make this stuff up. You can't make it up. And there's my older sister. I believe that's Laura. I believe that's Laura. Um, with our Cocker Spaniel, Pepe. Who didn't live that much longer than that. I forget what happened to Pepe. But anyway. And then we ended up getting some schnauzers. Um, so, Yeah. That's uh, that's that's how we used to dress back in the day. What do you guys think about that? Uh, what do you think of cashiers referring to as dude or bro? <laughs> the places I shop, they don't do that yet. They don't do that yet. <laughs> that's funny. Craig, you should lose the. You should lose the crawl. After a few minutes, it makes your channel look like a low-budget cable channel. Yeah, but everybody keeps asking for the date of the Little Treasury Watch event. And that's why I'm leaving it on there. Because otherwise, invariably, they're going to ask me what the date is of the event. And so, but yeah, I hear you that it's a little bit busy. Um, but uh, that's that's why it's on there. So, but I I, I take your comment under under advisement and i think you are probably correct so um <clears throat> triforce when i wear a suit and go out some people confuse me for an employee <laughs> i was at my bank before meeting and some asian lady could barely speak english kept pestering me <laughs> oh boy uh, yeah that could happen i can see that um if it was a if it was a good looking Asian lady about your age, you might be you might um, appreciate that. How's that? I'm in California. I don't need to stay warm. <laughs> Dry force rich, doesn't it? It gets cool at night there sometimes, right? It it gets cool cool in places like Los Angeles at night. It cools down, right? Because you always see all those old Columbo movies. He's wearing a suit and his um, trench coat and everything, and he was in uh, L.A. <clears throat> so do tell ties were invented to protect the shirt when the ties were cheaper than a shirt sounds like a good well they're still cheaper than a shirt they can't certainly certainly can be um and uh somebody says haha nice okay and triforce rich let's see your sister is dressed like a grandma but that makes sense because she's a grandma haha -ha, and grandmas are from the 60s okay all right um Let's see here. Uh, t -t -t had a tie on today for the first time in a while uh, with a Rolex looking tie clip that I bought for $3. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. <clears throat> that is cool. <clears throat> All right. So, um, air toad, rub pie, ha hallmarks add to the cool factor of a signet ring just sent a photo of mine okay we'll take a look i'll pull up the email here in a minute and we'll take a look 
And Jen's Christian 499. Um, great broadcast topic today, Craig. Got to head out. Here's a token of appreciation to support the channel. Well, thank you so much. It was not necessary at all, but I absolutely appreciate it. And I hope you uh, didn't leave before I got a chance to thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see here. Not as bad as wearing a red shirt at Target. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. And let's see. We got another one here. In the winter in California, it might get into the 30s, but that is very rare. Normally, you're looking at 60s at night with some days in the 50s. Well, in the 60s, you could certainly wear a nice sport coat. That would be nice sport coat weather, especially if it's the low 60s. Um, and certainly in the 50s. Um, not as bare. Okay, I already got that one. And okay, I got that. I think I'm caught up here. Southern California. I mean, Northern Cal, Cal is much cooler. There you go. Well, of course, Colombo was in Southern California. He was in Los Angeles. So um, let's check the email. Um, cut back here while I get the email up. <clears throat> Yes. Um, my guess is it'll have a lot of cool stuff like that. Absolutely. And I really like that ring that that is a beautiful style. Well done. Uh, do you wear it much? Do you wear that ring much? Uh, share in the uh, chat. I like it. I think it's a stunner. I think it would go very nicely with a gold stunner. Yes, it would. <clears throat> Two thumbs up for the signet ring. All right. Um, Craig, you should try Sterling Shave Soap. Good stuff. Great aftershave lotion and balm, too. I'll make a mental note to check it out, to check, check, check it out. Uh, let's see here. Let's see what else we've got that, that we can take a look at here. Um, Oh, by the way, I have um, uh, I have a bunch of videos on my channel comparing different watches and so on. So always do a keyword search on the channel. Here was a video I did comparing the uh, GS Diver and a Rolex, comparing and contrasting. Okay, move over, Rolex Submariner. Make room for the Grand Seiko SBGA 231. And if you follow my channel, you know I proclaimed the Seiko Shogun SBDC007 to be the best watch ever made. And I made a good case for it. And part of it is this titanium, which is the same titanium, I believe, that's used on this Grand Seiko that makes these watches. Okay, so I did make a little mistake there. And, I, and the, a lot of people made that same mistake. They are different. The, uh, the Seiko uses a coating, a Dia Shield, I think, a coating on their titanium, which makes it very scratch resistant. And, and you know, it's, it's good stuff. Grand Seiko does not use the coating. Grand Seiko does use a special alloy of titanium that's very tough stuff, but they do not use a coating on it. And they do that because it's easier to refinish it and all that. With the coating, you really can't refinish the watch. Uh, so there's advantages and disadvantages to the coating. The coating is tough stuff, but if it finally does give up the ghost, if you will, it's, it's kind of like a problem, right? Sort of like having like a clear coat on a car. Once the clear coat goes, you're kind of done for. I think it's a similar situation. So um, keep that in mind. Um, uh uh, by the way, Craig, I met two guys from the greater Frederick area recently. I kind of freaked out and was like, I know someone from there. Would you like me to, would you like me to connect you with one? He's a very wealthy financial advisor. Uh, he might be a potential good guy to bring on. Yeah. I'd love to bring him on the channel. Uh, yeah. I'd love to talk to him. I, I wonder if he's hip on, um, 
on Bitcoin. A lot of financial advisors have, have been asleep at the switch on that one. Um, I wonder if he's hip on that. Uh, let's see. Sterling is made in the USA by mom and pop veteran couple. Just your style. I love it. I love it. If you know them, let them know. Have them give me a shout out. They should come on the channel. He owns a financial consulting firm, so no middle management directly to the source. Cool. And you sure it's Frederick County, Maryland? Because there's a Frederick County in Virginia also. Um, let's see here. The GS line lion holding a wrench would work on the ring yes yeah, see we're not going to do um we're not going to do a gs thing it's not going to be a gs uh connected thing because we're going to there's potentially copyright issues and things like that um and we could never get permission from grand seiko to do that so we're going to try to come up with our own design I suggested using part of the little treasury logo, the top part of the little treasury logo and combine a wrench and, and then the number. I don't want it to be real busy, right? And so, cause like this one here is kind of similar to the way the little treasury thing flares out, but it'd be half, it, it, it kind of could be similar, but he's gonna hopefully get somebody that can design it and so that it looks pretty good somebody that has an eye for design. But the important thing is I want each one of them numbered so that people know it's an extremely limited edition, very, very special piece for just the right individuals. Um, let's see. Um, wasn't a lady from Brooks Brothers supposed to do a show? No, it, she, she represents... Um, Oxford clothes, custom-made Oxford clothes, but she flaked out. Imagine that. She flaked out and didn't come on the show. She was going to, but she didn't. And she said she was going to, and then I reached out to her a few times to try to schedule it, and, you know, nothing happened in there. So, I, I you know, you, you can lead a horse to water. You can't make them drink. Signet ring is to go with yellow gold day date, which I don't have yet. <clears throat> well, it'll be able to go with any yellow gold watch that you get. If you get yellow gold, which is what I would recommend. Um, like for Carlos, I mean, he could get a white gold one to go with his white gold day date. I'm sure Steve could get them either way. Um, but I highly recommend, of course, yellow, yellow gold. <clears throat> Okay, if I give him your contact info. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd like him to come on the show and talk about finance. Finance is an important thing. You know, here's the thing. Step one is getting, building wealth. And step two is arguably harder than step one. And that's keeping it. <laughs> the tax man, the, the ex-wives, you know, everybody wants to go after that money, right? Everybody wants to go after that money. And so the, the tricky part is, is keeping it, getting it is, is not easy, but, but, uh, keeping it, that's, um, <clears throat> that can be a challenge. Thankfully we've got Bitcoin, which seems to be helping out by the way, Bitcoin pumped a little bit earlier. Uh, let me see what it's doing right now. It's been, it's been, uh, it's been a little volatile. Imagine that. Imagine Bitcoin being volatile. So we're at forty thousand nine hundred and seventy-seven dollars right now. <clears throat> okay, and so um, there are people that say that if it can hold over forty thousand dollars here for a little bit, that uh, it's going to break out and go much higher. I don't know. I think most of these chart people you know, technical analysis people, I think most of them don't have a freaking clue what they're talking about. And that's why they're in their mom's basement doing their YouTube videos. Um, let's see, is Acura equal to Lexus? I, I think Lexus has a little bit of an edge, but I think they're probably both very good. But I think, you know, the Lexus LS sedan, the V8 sedan, up to the LS 460. I don't think I'd go beyond that one. But an LS460 or an LS430 or even a really nice LS400, if you could find one, those are all pretty freaking amazing bulletproof 
cars. So think about that. <clears throat> Read my comment above. He'd want to come on to promote his new book. So as long as that is okay, I can make the promo deal happen. I'm sure he'll talk BTC. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you said read the one from above. Okay, if I give him your contact info. Yeah, I said that. I think I read all of them. I, I read this one. Uh, yep, Marilyn, which is why I freaked out. He's also an author. Okay, yeah, I didn't read this one. Sure, you enjoyed that. I'll connect with him and make it happen. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. And hers. Okay. All right. So I'm caught up there. So let's see if there's anything else that I forgot to, um, it's a joy to drive my Lexus every day. Happy with my decision. Yeah. Triforce Rich got a Lexus also. Absolutely. He did. <clears throat> um, I think he got a newer unit though. And for the folks, these these folks that bought the ugly watches. But I pity the fool. But I pity the fool. He says, I pity the fool, you know. So that that's how that whole thing worked out. Um see what else. Uh all right, we dealt with all of that. Let's get some pictures here. Let's get some pictures. Oh, here's the signet rings. This is what I sent to Steve as an idea of, of the shape of the signet ring and the style of the signet ring. Not the, you know, the actual engraving. Obviously, it'll be whatever engraving we, we, we land on. But that's, that's the general look of the rings. Okay. And uh, now speaking of dressing for success, here we are out at the uh, Polo Club. Out at the Polo Club. That's right. The polo club. That was a warm day. So I'm wearing the Madras jacket with a uh, polo shirt underneath. And uh, that's how you do at, at the polo club when you're tailgating, when you're tailgating, tailgating out of a Lincoln limousine. There's the driver there to my left. OK, and then this is the Admiral, the Admiral, Admiral Day and his wife, Dorothy. And he was wearing a Rolex with the bracelets. He always wore the, the face of the watch on the inside of the um, wrist. And he was wearing just a, a very basic Rolex Oyster Perpetual on an Oyster bracelet. And of course, I was wearing in that picture, I was wearing the 1803 with the conventional clasp. And of course, Ray-Bans and of course, khakis and an Indian Madras shirt. Okay, so that's how that's how you do that. Um, let's see what else. And of course, you can wear sport watches or dress watches, right? Depending on the circumstance. All right. And here's talk about well dressed. Steve is always well dressed, and there he is wearing the 002. The day that I bought it, he put it on wrist with his faux pay. So there you go. And on the left there, that's me with, with the 002 before I got the faux pay. And that's wearing uh, Bill's khakis and some shoes by Edward Green and a linen shirt by, um, oh boy, uh, Kenneth Gordon. Kenneth Gordon made that shirt. And let's see what else. And of course, you can wear a day date. Of course, you can wear a day date. That works. There's a, there's a six digit day date. And of course, shoes made in Maine. Why not? And why not some nice Lucchese boots, some alligator Lucchese boots made in the original San Antonio factory? Why not that? Why not something custom and a nice strap for your watch, right? Something like that. So there you go. That's what we're talking about. Um, let's see. Wow, that jacket somewhere, there's a VW missing its seat covers. Yeah, some of those really cool VWs from the 60s. Yeah, absolutely. That jacket was made by Corbin, I think. 
I think I got it at the uh, Georgetown University shop. Corbin made a lot of um, jackets and things like that for high-end uh, men's clothing men's clothing stores. And of course, a Madras jacket like that is very common in the summer, in the hot weather, <clears throat> Indian Madras. Um, that or a seersucker would be would be some, a common choice. Um, <clears throat> Craig, you're a successful retired car salesman. What made you stop? Was it when you saw the Prius and realized that no other car in the world did not matter anymore? Um, I, you know, I got into business for myself. I did uh, have a car lot with a partner that we did for a while uh, that was basically a used car lot. We, we had uh, electric car franchises, and that was the way to get basically a used car license in Montgomery County, Maryland. At the time, you couldn't do it as just a standalone uh, used car lot. So we got a couple of uh, electric car franchises. This was in 1980. We opened in June of 1980. And, um, but we dealt in, in antique and collector cars and we dealt in some other just front of the mill cars. And I'll never forget that our nut, our monthly nut was $6,600 a month. That's how much we need, had to bring in before we covered our overhead and profit, right? We had to bring in $6,600 in profit just to pay our rent and all of our other expenses. <clears throat> And it just got to be a grind and I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy the pressure of having all that overhead, uh, having to meet that nut. So I swore I, I was able to sell out to my partner and get out of that business. And I swore that I would never have another high overhead business again, that, that my businesses would be constructed in such a way that they would be low overhead, but that I would also have significant competitive advantages. And so that's the businesses that I engineered after that were around that, uh, that theory. And uh, one of which was doing appraisals of antique and classic cars and things like that. In other words, using my knowledge, le leveraging my knowledge to make money. And I enjoyed that. I drove all around the Washington, D.C. metro area. I served the entire metro area. And I did a bunch of appraisals and I did expert witness testimony and things like that. I made good money. I was able to get a hold of cars sometimes at good prices because people would call me and they would not want to pay for an appraisal, but they say, I just want to sell it. I'd say, well, you know, you should have it appraised so you get a fair price. And say, no, I just, what will you give me for it? You know, that type of thing. And sometimes they were a car that I actually wanted, right? That, you know, it was a Mercedes with low mileage or something, something I could do something with. Right. And so I'd snag some deals on cars. And so I'd, drive them for a while and then I'd sell them. And that's what I did. That's why I drove for free basically, because I was driving a lot. Right. And so normally that would be a significant expense, but I drove for free because I would get a car for a really good price. I'd clean it up, detail it, all that, keep it in immaculate shape. I knew mechanics who could fix anything that needed to be fixed or whatever. And then I'd drive it until somebody just had to have it and and offered me a ridiculous price for it and then i would sell it and then i'd repeat the process rinse and repeat right and so i was basically always driving for free and so um so that was all good and then eventually and then i got i started in a uh, an advertising business did that for a while and then when the internet came around i decided to uh do what i'm doing now with the community websites and all that and i bought a bunch of domain names Again, knowledge, knowledge working for you, right? I had the knowledge at the time that you could buy and reserve domain names that were first come, first grab. And so I was able to get some decent domain names and later sell some of those. And some of them, of course, I kept for, for various businesses. And, um, and so, again, that gave me a competitive advantage because I have frederick.com, right? And nobody else has that in Frederick, right? And so that gives me a competitive advantage to build a website about Frederick that, that, you know, might have an edge over other people trying to do similar things. So that was the thought process on all of those things is have some kind of an edge, some kind of an advantage. <clears throat> Even when I was doing the um, appraisal business, I had an advantage because I had the, the advertising business where I had displays in hotel lobbies that people called that had a phone, people picked up the phone and called for the service. It was called dial a service. 
And, you know, we had restaurants, dry cleaners, all different kinds of businesses advertising on there. It was up to 32 ad spots on each display because the phone had 32 buttons, Touchmatic 32. So I had those, those displays in hotel lobbies, and each one of those was technically a business phone. And so with each one of those displays, I could get a free listing in the Yellow Pages. Back then, Yellow Pages was the whole thing. There was no internet, right? So I could get a free listing in the Yellow Pages with each one of those displays. So I would take that free listing and put it in under different categories in the Yellow Pages for my appraisal business. So I would get a bunch of basically free advertising, which gave me a big competitive advantage over any other appraisers that were listed in the yellow pages because they couldn't do that. They'd have to pay, pay for all those listings, right? And so I had an unfair advantage over other people wanting to do appraisals in the area. And so I ended up totally dominating that, that business. And, um, and also I was willing to serve the entire area for a flat fee. A bunch of the others were, were, pricing it depending on where you were and all this that you know complicated pricing and all that i had flat pricing for the whole area and it all averaged out it all worked out right and so some of those things just gave me a a, a competitive advantage if you were if you will um let's see here's another comment um one of the other watch channels was claiming that Steve loans you out the watches and you are beholden to Steve for advertisement. I told them they were wrong, but they insisted. I, I wish. <laughs> I wish. Hey, if he loaned me out watches, wouldn't I have different watches all the time? I mean, I've had the, um, I've had the diver for almost four years now. I've had this one, you know, well over a year. Um, it's not like I'm going through a bunch of different watches. I went through a few watches in, in the beginning when I was transitioning from Rolex to Grand Seiko. You know, I, I went through a couple of them until I really realized what I, what I wanted. Um, and he's given me good deals on the watches. You know, absolutely he's given me good deals. And he's given other subscribers good deals on watches. But no, he doesn't loan me out um, any watches. He should. I think it would be smart for him to do that. But no, he doesn't. If he did, I'd have two or three watches here to show you. I think if he was smart, he would send me a different watch every week to be the watch of the week. And I'd be showing it off of here on the channel. Um, but I think he's too busy to even worry about it. I, I, I think it's just, um, it's not even on his radar screen. I mean, he can do a show here on this channel anytime he wants. He has full authorization. He has a setup at Grant at, at Little Treasure Jewelers. He has a setup at his home. He can go live here on this channel anytime he wants and talk about his watches. Um, but he doesn't because I think he's just too busy, you know? Um, so no, I mean... <laughs> Uh, again, I wish they were right, but obviously they don't watch this channel because they would know that I don't have a bunch of watches laying around here, right? Otherwise, I would certainly be showing them off. Uh, let's see, Triforce Rich. Craig, what would you say is the greatest car you've ever driven? Um, I'll tell you, the Mercedes 300 SL. Uh, no, I'm not, th not 300 SL, 300 SEL 6.3, uh, sedan with the 6.3 engine in it. Um, I think it was around a 1972. I think that was about the year. Um, uh, I sold it on consignment actually for a friend of mine who had it for a while. And that car was freaking amazing talk about a car that would get up and crawl that car was amazing and of course i drove like brand new um porsche 930 turbos i mean they were amazing but i'll tell you that the, the the car that i did a road trip with that was really surprised me it was eye opener was a 1986 porsche 944 turbo that car was unbelievable. I drove it from Texas to Maryland at extremely high speed, and it was just glued to the road. A lot of that trip was heavy rain, 
and it was just glued to the road and was just absolutely amazing. So that for a road trip, that car was was wild. My cousin was following me on a 911 and he had trouble keeping up. Um, we were driving two cars back from Texas. That was when um, uh, uh, Houston was having a lot of financial troubles and you're able to buy Porsches at a good price down there and then bring them up here to, to the D.C. area and, and sell them. And so we did a few road trips like that. But that 1986 944 Turbo was freaking amazing. The uh, the V12 E-Type uh, Jaguar, I had a 1974, I believe it was, um, uh, E-Type V12. And that one, there was one time we couldn't get it started. And I was cussing that thing. <laughs> and I was like, um, I was saying... You know, these things are famous for using a ton of fuel, right? They get terrible fuel mileage. I said, I'll give you all the high test fuel you want. Just start up and run. Right? <laughs> My buddy finally came and opened up the trunk and slapped on the on the electric uh, fuel pump that was in the trunk on those cars. And we got it running. And that thing was a blast. That V12 uh, E-type Jag, that was a blast to drive also. It was just a whole different thing with the convertible and that long hood. And, the, you know, it was just talk about a car that's so freaking sexy. I mean, the, la the, the ladies would go crazy over that type of thing. Um, uh, let's see. And yeah. And, and so, yeah. So I think he likes that Porsche drove across country. Yeah. I drove it from Texas to, um, to maryland it was unbelievable craig have you ever had legitimate competition of a rival um i mean i've had rivals attack me and try to destroy me like the frederick news post here in, in town um you know but i mean if you call that competition um so i'm not sure what else let's see what channel? Hello. Okay. Um, what a fantastic business story. Thank you for sharing Stig in the house. Uh, let's see. And Kyle's in the house. Try first. Search. I think my grandpa actually drove that car. I have to confirm uh, with my dad. Okay. Um, sup Kyle. And, uh, let's see. Hey, Rich and everyone. Hope you all doing well. Okay. Um, Mr. Submarine, we missed you. Uh, what kept you? Yeah, does he have a note for being late? Uh, Craig, what advice would you give to a young guy in business? Get an edge. Figure out something that you can do well. Figure out a plan that you can get an edge, some competitive advantage. And then outwork anybody else that might want to, uh, yeah, compete with you. Um. Uh, the portion Scarface was a 928, right? Yes, yes. The 928 that he that he picked out and he said he wanted bulletproofed and all that. Yeah, and and that was really true to true to form that movie because those were the cars we were selling. And and uh, when I worked at Capital Porsche Audi in 1979, um, in 19 right into early 1980. <clears throat> Uh, those were the cars we were selling was the 928s. And those were the people we were selling them to the drug dealers, the 928, the 930. Uh, mainly they wanted the 928 though. Uh, so that was the proper car casting in that movie. I'll put it that way. And the roles, same type of thing. Yeah, they were, they were definitely buying those kinds of cars. Um, one of our sales reps there at uh, Capital Porsche Audi was from Bolivia. <laughs> he was a Bolivian. <laughs> Another one was from Cuba. Um, they all had connections all over the place. Uh, Stig, I was at the Korean spa. Oh, there you go. Uh, the greatest rivalry on YouTube is Craig versus Mark Goldberg. The funniest part is that they are both the same age, old whitey, old white guys that talk about watches all the time. I think he's a lot younger than me. I don't think he's 63 years old. I think he's younger than me. <clears throat> so, yeah, there's that. I see. 
I say that because I think by the time he's my age, he'll be a lot smarter than he is now. I think, you know, he's, he's got a lot to learn and I, and I think he will because he's, you know, he's got time to, to learn. I think he's younger. Uh, let's see, Craig, would it be wrong to swap a small block Chevy V8 into an E-Type? I think people have probably done that. I mean, my gosh, if you can get some reliability out of the damn thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that would probably be a good move. Um, but when they were running right, I mean, they're, they're really cool. I mean, they're, I mean, they're like, it's like a, that the V12, it's like so smooth and it's, it's so buttery. And I'll tell you the other cars with V12s that were so smooth was the Packards, the V12 Packard. One of those would pull into the car show and you wouldn't even know the damn thing was running. I mean, it was great. And my buddy, I mean, uh, had a, uh, a 53 Packard petition with factory air and that car, you could barely know it was running. It was a, it was a straight eight, but you know, back then the thing was they tried to make cars so that they were very, very quiet right now. They try to make them so they were sound throaty and all this stuff. But back then they wanted the car, a luxury car, you wanted it to be as silent as possible and they'd pull into the car show and you'd hear hear twigs breaking underneath the tires and stuff they were so quiet so yeah um oh here we got I missed one uh not that kind of place okay craig what do you think of modern men's fashion and the current uh demasculation event it's a sad time isn't it? i think we've kind of talked about that a little bit with the uh these suits that have the real short sport coats and the tight fitting pants and the you know all these things that uh no I, I i think that uh it's a total fail clothing was always made for a purpose it was made to be comfortable and when you bought a more expensive shirt it had more fabric in it not less and when you bought an expensive suit it had a lot of fabric in it remember those suits from like the 30s and stuff where the the, the legs the pant legs were huge right the reason they put all that fabric in those is when you sit down, if you're wearing tight pants, they bind. It's uncomfortable. When you bend your knee, it all binds and it's tight. The reason they put extra fabric in all those things is so that you can move around and you can do what you need to do. They're so comfortable. Um, you know, it, uh, it, it, it goes against logic to take and ruin all of that just because somebody thinks it looks cool. Trevor's rich says he's the same age, Craig. I think he's 62 or 63. Okay. Well, maybe he doesn't have time to learn then. Maybe he's, um, yeah, maybe there's no hope for him. Okay. Craig, didn't you say that, uh, Bolivian salesman was an ultra Chad who could pick up women. I think actually it was the one from, um, the one that really could, the Bolivian guy could too, but the one that really could was the one from uh, um, Cuba. He was Cuban. George Gallert, Jorge, uh, J-O-R-G-E, Gallert. Um, I don't know if you can find him on Facebook or if he's still around or, or whatever, but yeah, I mean, he would walk in to any party, anything, and any girl there including the girl that was there with his, with her boyfriend. I mean, you know, he could go right up to them and just take them. I mean, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, he was like, um, he looked a lot like Richard Gere. And remember that movie, Richard Gere, American Gigolo? This guy was like that. This guy was just like that character. Um, and, and a cross between him and the character in Saturday Night Fever, right? The, the lead character in Saturday Night Fever. He could be a cross between those two, uh, John Travolta's character in that. Um, I mean, he was just legendary uh, with the women. They would all just melt. Didn't matter who they were. <clears throat> he had, he was working at, um, at uh, Wheaton Dodge with me before we, went on to other places and he ended up at the uh, Porsche uh, dealership with us. Um, he was working at Wheaton Dodge and the daughter of the sales manager, uh, her name was Desi Walker and he was Harry Walker and Desi was gorgeous. I mean, she was just like a knockout. 
And she came to the dealership one day and she bumped into George Gallard. And that was it. I mean, he, they, they were an item for a while and, and he knew it. And the sales manager knew it, that this guy was with his daughter and he didn't do anything about it. Cause I guess he figured he couldn't do anything about it. And, and also George was a pretty good sales <laughs> salesman, <laughs> but that was funny. I mean, and nobody thought that he would be able to take out, take her out. And she was gorgeous. Um, but of course he did. So I haven't heard from, from Chip in forever. Have you talked to him? Uh, to, uh, uh, which Chip? Okay. Um, <clears throat> you and Dog Trainer are the same age. Okay. Um, Craig, did you hear about the Timepiece Gentleman scandal? Is there another one? Another scandal? <laughs> Do tell. Is this something new? I heard about when they shut down their social media and all of that, and it turned out to be a whole nothing burger. Um, but anyway, I, I don't know what the late. I'm not hip to the latest. Could old George Gallert is probably uh, picking up at the ladies at the retirement home. Yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting to see if he finally settled down and married a lady of means or something like that, that's what he should have done. If he was smart is, you know, married some Uber rich girl. And that's what he should have done before he got too old. Right. But I don't know. I haven't seen George Gow. I haven't heard what he's doing. I think I should try to figure it out, try to look him up and see what's going on. He could tell some real war stories. Next time, um, if Bill Steers ever comes up and is on a show again, you can ask him about George Gallard because he worked at Wheaton Dodge at the same time when um, when I worked there. Um, and he also went on to work at uh, Capital Porsche Audi. And he also worked at the Volkswagen dealer next door. I, I worked at the Volkswagen dealer next door first. And the owner of that um, franchise uh his daughter was was hot kim larson um his name was was larson and he wore a date eight um no no i'm sorry no no he he was at the lincoln dealership larson he wore a date eight and the owner of the um jewish guy owned the volkswagen dealership he wore a date eight and super loose he wore it suit like with all the links in the bracelet he wore it super loose and i never could figure that out um could George pick up Bree, do you think? Yes, 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 he could. Any any woman at all he could he could pick up. Yeah, and I think he could probably pick up Bree. I don't think she would be immune to his charms. But she would she would possibly reject him when she found out he didn't have any Bitcoin. So that that might absolutely happen. Um so the 928 was more popular than 911 at that time with the drug dealers. Yeah, definitely with the drug dealers, not overall, but what the, the drug dealers seem to like the 928. Uh, could George picked up Rano. Okay. We talked about that. Uh, what's your favorite all time American car? Wow. Um, <clears throat> tell you the truth i really liked the um the gt390 mustang i had i had a gt390 fastback 1967 i believe it was it was a 67 or 68 it was basically the bullet car like was used in the movie bullet it was dark green with a stick shift with the hearse shifter it was a gt390 that thing would get up and freaking crawl that in, in some ways, I like that over the um, GT500 convertible Shelby, um, just because it was a coupe. It wasn't quite as heavy as the convertible. And although the the, um, the uh, Shelby had the 428 in it, the 390, there was just something about that coupe with the, with the 390 and the Hurst shifter and the four-speed. It was just a really, really cool car. Um so that might, that's way up there. Now, if you want to go to a luxury car, I really liked my 65 Fleetwood, 65 Cadillac Fleetwood. I liked the 1964 Imperial, Imperial LeBaron. It had a 
factory dual air conditioning. So it's, it's hard. I had a bunch of good, good luxury cars. I, I preferred the luxury cars for, for driving around and all the, the Mustang with the GT 390, that was just like, get on it, you know, I mean, just get on it. <laughs> that was just, I mean, and I drove cars hard back in the day. Let me tell you something. We didn't baby any of those cars. When you worked at dealerships and things like that, and you went through a lot of cars, you didn't give a damn. You were hard on, it was like driving a rental car, right? I mean, you were hard on stuff. And even the stuff, the cars that I was buying and selling, I mean, I, I, I used them. I used them. Uh, you need to connect with George Gallo and bring him on live. I, I have to try to figure out how to find him. Okay, detectives, get on it. I, I want you guys to, I want you detectives to get on it. Find George Gallert. Find him. Let's get him on the show. <clears throat> okay, hit him up. I need my detectives on it. Do you have a pic of him? I don't, unfortunately, from back in the day. No, I don't. I don't have that many photos, period, from back in the day, because back in the day, it was all film cameras. And, I, I, you know, you've seen most of the f pictures I have. Not that many. Craig, hard question. One roast beef sub from Hoffman's Market or one Tudor watch that you have to wear and cannot sell. I wouldn't wear the Tudor. Yeah, I'd just take the sub. Life's too short to wear a Tudor. We're going to get Bill and Karen on a show together, I thought. Bill and Ken. Oh, you mean Bill and Kent. I don't know if we'll ever be able to put that together. It's hard enough to get Bill to come up here, period. Um, but I don't think we'll get him here at the same time. And, and, and neither one of them can come in remotely because Kent has terrible Internet and Bill is a, uh, a technology um, uh, Luddite. So he's not capable of coming in via remotely. Uh, we need them. Uh, Kyle Jett, uh, this world needs a Jay-Z and Kent Courtney collaboration. <laughs> and he, jeez, uh, oh, you guys are too much. Um, uh, I'll check LinkedIn for him. Yeah. See if you can find him. He's, he might still be in the metro area. His um, mom lived in Rockville. His mom lived in Rockville, Maryland. I heard he he went he was in Northern Virginia last I heard Northern Virginia area, but he, you know that was thirty five years ago or you know last I heard. And we need George on the stream. Oh, it would be great for him to tell some uh, war stories. Um, uh, what's that other guy's? What was the Bolivian guy's name? I doubt he's still alive. Um, uh, but Bill Steers might remember some of those people from uh, from Capital Porsche Audi days also. And. Um, yeah, and I don't know if George worked at Capital Porsche when uh, Bill Steers did or not. I don't know if they overlapped there, um, but they de definitely did at Wheaton Dodge. They were definitely at Wheaton Dodge at the same time. All right, so uh, let's see. Uh, Craig, did you pick up any new subscribers from the TPG drama? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, what if George invested in BTC with his dead rich wife's fortune and is now a billionaire? That'd be a good thing. I always liked George. We got along. He was a good guy. He always had his demo like detailed, like spotless. I mean, most of us did. Most of us kept our demos in good shape, right? Because, I mean, you know, you were using it as a demonstrator. You were trying to sell cars. But he just like went overboard. I mean, he always had his car just detailed to within an inch of its life. And, uh, you know, you tip the lot of tenant and, and they'll, they'll do it for you. But um, he always dressed to the T. Um, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was pretty wild. George Gallert. Hopefully you can get some old pictures of him. You can dig up some pictures on the internet of George Gallert. Uh, George sounds like a lot like Chip Wong. <laughs> yeah, right. 
Right, right. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. My gosh, it's been more than an hour. We've been going more than an hour, guys. You should have told me it was time to wrap up the show. Okay, you kept me going here, and it was time to wrap up. So here's one of those watches that Steve loans me <laughs> that I've had like four years. <laughs> these people on these watch channels, they can make up anything, can't they? Can't they just make up any old story they want? Um, <laughs> but anyway, we'll see you guys next time. Hopefully, we can do a show. And hopefully, you guys can run down uh, George Gallert, and we can get him on the show. That would be fantastic. And find out what Desi Walker's doing. Um, Harry Walker's daughter. Let's see what she's doing these days. We'll find out. We'll get the detectives on it. Carry on, everybody.